In this unit, we focus on the addition of halo acids, such as H HCl and HBr, to alkyne molecules. You should see a lot of parallels between this reaction and reactions where we did the addition of halo acids to alkenes, in that what's going to happen here is that the alkyne pi bonds are the reactive component that's going to act as a base during the first step of the pro during the first step of the reaction to get protonated by the acid. And then from there, we'll have the bromide or chloride nucleophile come in and attack. So let's go ahead with no further ado and take a closer look at this reaction type. What we'll do is we're going to start with an alkyne molecule. And I'm going to purposefully make this an asymmetrically substituted alkyne, meaning in this case an alkyne that has a primary carbon atom and a secondary carbon atom as part of the alkyne group so that we can see whether this reaction has any regioselectivity or not in terms of how we're going to decide where to add the H and the Cl across the carbon-carbon double bond here. So we're going to go ahead and add HCl. And I'm going to specify here that we're using one equivalent of HCl in this particular situation, so meaning a one-to-one -one molar ratio of alkyne to the hydrochloric acid. Let's go ahead then and think about what the first step of this reaction mechanism would be. And one of the key tenets that we've learned about mechanisms so far is that if there is a relatively strong acid present, such as HCl, sulfuric acid, etc. the first step of any reaction mechanism is generally going to be protonation. And that's exactly what we want to do here, is protonate the organic molecule. So we'll do protonation by taking our alkyne molecule and using one of its sets of pi electrons as the base to grab a proton from the HCl acid. So this step should look very analogous to addition reactions to alkenes, where in the first step of addition reactions to alkenes, that pi bond also came over, grabbed a proton from the acid, forcing the hydrogen chlorine bond to break to leave us with chloride anion, as well as our carbocation intermediate. And here, just like with addition reactions to alkenes, we're going to follow so-called Markovnikov's rule, which I'm going to abbreviate just as Mark's rule for short to make that determination of where to add the hydrogen onto this molecule. We're going to add the hydrogen to create the most stable carbocation possible. And the way that we create the most stable carbocation possible is by adding the hydrogen to the carbon that has more hydrogens already. So following Mark's rule means that where we want to put that proton that we've just brought into the molecule is going to be right here. So at this terminal end, we originally had a CH group, and now what we would end up having is a CH2 group. So we're going to have two hydrogens there because we just brought in one anew. This other carbon here, on the other hand, is now only going to have three bonds to it, and therefore there's going to be a carbocation there. So I'm just going to put a plus sign there to indicate that's where our carbocation goes. So we've followed Mark's rules here by adding the hydrogen to our carbon atom that is less substituted, meaning the one that has fewer alkyl groups and more hydrogens bonded to it. And that's the purpose of this is to make the more stable carbocation because we made a secondary carbocation now instead of a primary carbocation. Then from there, what's going to happen at step two of the reaction mechanism should also look like a throwback to our chapter on alkene addition reactions in that the nucleophilic chloride anion is going to come in and attack the electrophilic carbocation. So we're going to have the nucleophile, that is our halogen anion, which I'm going to put as X minus attacks the electrophile, and that electrophile is our carbocation. And there will not be carbocation rearrangements in this particular reaction due to the fact that we have the alkene group there. We won't be doing a carbocation rearrangement in this, so you go straight onward to the nucleophile attack. So the chloride comes in, attacks the carbocation right there, and we'll go ahead and draw out the product of that reaction. We're going to make the product here. So we had a CH2 group at the left hand in there, so we don't really need to put any hydrogens in there explicitly unless we want to. Then we have a methyl group coming off of the alkene group and our newly brought in chlorine atom, like so. So this is going to be our product that will result from the addition of one equivalent of HCl across a carbon-carbon triple bond. That's going to give us an alkene that is now substituted with a halogen atom, like so here. And we're going to follow Mark's rule. So we would definitely describe this reaction as certainly being regioselective because at the beginning step, we had two different possible places where we could have put the proton. In actuality, we preferentially chose to put it on that less substituted carbon. 
So we would describe this situation that we looked at here as being regioselective. We can also ask ourselves whether the reaction is stereoselective. In this particular case, if we look at the product and ask ourselves whether there's any R, S, or E, or Z const, uh, configurational isomers that can result, the answer here is that no. In this particular situation, there are no chiral carbons, and there are actually no stereocenters either. There's no places for E, Z to form here either because if we take a look at our carbon-carbon double bond here, since we have the carbon-carbon double bond at the end, we have two hydrogens there, and it doesn't matter which one's on top and which one's on bottom, you would have the same molecule one way or the other, so there is no E or Z here, and therefore there is no stereoselectivity in this particular reaction that we've looked at, so it's not stereoselective. And then the other thing we can look at and ask ourselves is, what would happen if rather than having one equivalent of HCl here, what if instead we had an excess of HCl, meaning that we had two equivalents of HCl or more in the reaction mixture? What would happen then? Let's take a look at that situation. So we'll go ahead and say, what if we had additional HCl available? And so to have additional HCl available, we'll typically write that as either HCl parentheses two equivalents, meaning there's a two to one molar ratio of the HCl to the alkyne starting material, or this is commonly written instead as HCl and then in parentheses XS. And the XS stands for having an excess of HCl, meaning more than two equivalents of HCl present in the reaction mixture. So let's take a look at what would happen then if we had an excess of HCl available. So first off, we're gonna do the initial addition reaction exactly like we would up top there. So one equivalent, the first equivalent of HCl would yield that product that we saw above using the mechanism that we saw above but then what if we have additional HCl to react with that initial product what will happen then is that we'll get an additional addition reaction taking place because we still have a pi bond available in the reaction and that pi bond is definitely susceptible to addition reactions so the pi bond comes over picks up a proton from HCl, that forces the bond between chlorine and hydrogen to break, and then that's gonna leave us with our next intermediate. So we go ahead and the first chlorine is still there, we haven't done anything with that. And that proton that we've just brought in is going to add to the carbon that's more protons already. So that would take our CH2 group that was at that left hand in by bringing an extra proton in, makes it CH3, and our carbocation is gonna end up right here. And this step of the reaction, of course, also yields chloride anion by breaking the bond between H and Cl. And that chloride anion then is poised to act as a nucleophile and come in and attacks the carbocation. So chloride anion comes in, attacks your carbocation right there, match made in heaven, to give us our final addition product. So this is what would happen if we had a second unit of chlorine available, is we're gonna add a second chlorine atom and a second hydrogen atom across the carbon-carbon double bond. So this would give us our final product right here. So we'll always end up in these situations with both of the chlorine atoms, or whatever halogen we're working with, being bonded to the same carbon in this case when we add two units of HCl or HBr, because we're following Markovnikov's rule in the second reaction mechanism, here at that first step of the second mechanism, just like we did in the first mechanism. So we just essentially repeated that mechanism that we did up top, doing another addition reaction. And the type of product that we would form here, the functional group that we can describe this as, is a geminal dihalide. So the term geminal means attached to the same carbon atom. So when we say a geminal dihalide, that means we have two halogen atoms that are bonded at the same carbon atom. You can think of this term and compare and contrast it with vicinal dihalide. Vicinal meant that the two chlorine atoms were on adjacent carbons. Geminal means that the two chlorine atoms are on the same carbon. So that's 
this particular reaction type. Let's look at another example problem and try to determine whether there's any situation that we can look at here where we could make the reaction stereoselective. Because we saw in this case, since the example we we're working with here had no E or Z stereocenters in the intermediates or in the final product, the reaction is not stereoselective, but it was regioselective at all the stages. Can we do a situation where the reaction will be stereoselective? Let's go ahead and look at that. So we'll take a look at this example problem here. In this problem, we're given one equivalent of deuterium bromide. Remember that when we put a D into the reaction, it's just replacing a hydrogen. We're going to assume that it will behave the same in the course of the reaction. The purpose of using this so-called isotope labeled starting material is that we will be able to track where that deuterium ends up at in the final molecule using analytical chemistry techniques. So we'll be able to tell the identity of that deuterium relative to the standard hydrogen one isotope that is already here, such as right there in the reaction mixture. So it's going to let us look more closely at the stereochemistry of our intermediates and our product of this reaction. We're adding one equivalent of DBR across the carbon-carbon triple bond. So let's go ahead and get started with that. We'll go ahead and look at the mechanism for this reaction. So the DBR we bring in here and we'll have our pi bond come over, attack the deuterium that forces the hydrogen bromine bond to break, leaving us with, in our product mixture, bromide anion, as well as our carbocation intermediate, which I'll go ahead and draw out here. So we'll add that deuterium to our carbon on the end here, following Mark's rule. That carbon's going to have a hydrogen bonded to it, which I had to start with, and the newly added deuterium atom, like so. And then the other thing that we need to think about here is the fact that we'll have a carbocation right there. And then at this point in the reaction, we can also ask what the geometry is of our carbocation intermediate. In other words, at this carbon, which I've highlighted in green here, what will the molecular geometry be there? And to answer the molecular geometry question, we have to ask how many regions of electron density are there around that carbon, and what can we do to space those as far apart as possible? So that carbon will have two regions of electron density surrounding it. One of those two regions is the carbon-carbon double bond, the other region is the carbon-carbon single bond. So with two regions of electron density, the best way to space those as far apart as possible is to make the geometry linear. And so we would expect that relative to this carbocation that I've highlighted in red here, that the molecular geometry is linear. And what that means is that much like if we're a trigonal planar, it's flat, and the bromide anion can then attack from the top face or the bottom face of the molecule. And what that's going to result in is the production of a mixture of the E and Z diastereomer products. So bromide comes in, and I'll go ahead and show that electron pushing arrow here. And the bromine can attack from the top or from the bottom. It doesn't matter since the carbocation is planar, and specifically linear in this case. So it attacks from the top or the bottom, no preference. And depending upon which side it attacks, that's going to lead to a mixture of two diastereomer products, the E and the Z forms. So we'll end up doing a mixture of E and Z, or you could also think of this as cis or trans if you're more comfortable with that terminology, where our bromine will have come in and formed a bond to that carbocation. So we'll put the bromine right there. And then at this end of the molecule, we'd have both the deuterium, that is the isotope labeled hydrogen, as well as our standard run of the mill hydrogen. And then to draw the diastereomer of that, all I need to do is in this other structure, flip the location of the deuterium relative to the hydrogen to give these two molecules that are related to one another as the E and Z forms of our product here. So with this in mind, looking at the molecular geometry of our intermediate being planar and keeping in mind that even with this isotope labeling experiment, if we did this in the lab, we would end up with a mixture of these two diastereomer products we can say then that this reaction type is not stereoselective. So it's not just these two examples that we've done here, but more of a general rule that the addition of HX across a carbon-carbon triple bond is not going to be stereoselective. 
So the rule is addition of HX to alkynes is not generally stereoselective. The reaction, on the other hand, can very much be regioselective. And we'd see that again in this example, because in this example, the deuterium has a clear preference for bonding to that carbon on the right, that is the less substituted carbon, and then the bromine bonds to the more substituted carbon. So just like the earlier example, this reaction we would say is indeed regioselective.